All right, well, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being here today. My name is Shilpa Dogra. I'm a faculty member at Ontario Tech University in the Faculty of Health Sciences and Kinesiology. And I'm one of the webinar people on the special interest group for aging with ISBINPA. Uh, I'm very pleased uh, to, have, to be hosting this session today. Uh, and hopefully everyone here is excited to learn more about the Global Age-Friendly University Network. We've got two folks that are here today to provide us with lots of insight into the actual Age-Friendly uh, University Network, how you can join, what it means to be a member, um, and then a case study on some of the uh, opportunities that exist if you do sort of decide to commit to these um, age-friendly principles that, uh, that we'll be discussing soon, I'm sure. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Aaron Guest, who's going to walk us through the Global Age-Friendly University Network. So I will stop sharing. <laughs> Thank you so much, and I'm thrilled to be here. And I just want to make sure everyone can see my slides. Yep, yeah, I'm seeing it. yes, great. Well, thanks so much. I, it's great to be with you and to be part of this conversation. Um, my name is Aaron Guest. I'm in the Center for Innovation in Healthy and Resilient Aging, uh, where the Secretariat is now housed uh, for the Age Friendly University Global Network. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But really, this global network is a network of higher ed education institutions committed to promoting positive and healthy aging, as well as enhancing the lives of older adults um, and older members of the global community through our innovative educational programs, research agendas, curriculum development, online education, health and wellness activities, arts and cultural programs, really anything that you can think of that falls within the confines of a university, we look forward to finding ways, particularly around that we can engage older adults in lifelong learning and other opportunities. And I do always include this definition just to say that an age-friendly university is an institution of our higher education who has endorsed the 10 principles, whereas the Age-Friendly University Global Network is the global network of age-friendly universities. Um, and to give you a little bit of back, I'm gonna provide a little bit of background about our network, and then I'm really excited to, to share with you and to learn with some colleagues on what they've been doing. And throughout this presentation, you might see these little dinosaur things, which are just a great way to scan and get access to um, web pages that relate to this. Our history dates back to 2012, where D Dublin City University convened an interdisciplinary working group to identify these distinctive contributions that older adults and older members of society could make um, and how our higher education institutions could be engaged in that process. As a result, the 10 principles of the age-friendly university were established. And these principles really sought to complement um, the World Health Organization's Age-Friendly Communities Program. And now they in fact serve as one of the core components of the age-friendly ecosystem. Um, as, and part of the reason we they were established and this group was convened is just looking at you know, sheer numbers. You know, the greatest indicator of how, how much I think things are changing is when we really break it down to how much growth there will be in our 65 plus population. I actually wish I had broke this down by 50 plus because that's really who we engage with. But if we just look at it in 2012, when these conversations were starting, we were about half a billion um, individuals over age 65 plus. By 2023, that had, that had rose to about 807 million. And then by 2050, we'll be at 1.6 billion. And so not only is the older population nearly tripling, but we also see that the population under age five is falling. So we're going, to, we're very much an aging planet. And we're an aging planet in the sense that we have more older adults than we've had at any point in our history. And we have a unique opportunity to find ways to engage them. The 10 principles of an age-friendly university are how we, through our efforts, try to do that. And these are 10 principles that were designed to ensure that older um, individuals are represented in um, higher education programming and that higher education institutions are developing programming and activities that really target and engage this population. So if we break these down, these incur include things such encouraging active participation in the core activities of the university, helping individuals in lifelong learning through second careers, educational needs, promoting intergenerational learning and exchange between learners of all ages, 
ensuring that there's online educational opportunities, which way back in 2012, um, no one could have foresaw what would happen with the COVID-19 pandemic and our movement online. Um, to ensure that the research agenda of universities is, ensure, is addressing the needs we see in an aging society, to, uh, to understand more and to explain to students really what it means to age and the longevity dividend to identify ways that we can increase engagement of older adults in the uni in university's health and wellness programs, as well as arts and cultural activities, to, and to engage with univ the university's own retired community of alums, faculty, and students. And then also to ensure that we're having regular dialogues amongst ourselves and others about how we can ensure that the, rep the interest of the aging population is represented throughout all that we do. In 2014, as this initiative was taking off, the Age Friendly University Global Network was started with three partners. And these, this really developed under the idea that there needed to be an organizing body to promote the principles, support adoption, and organize this growing age friendly university movement. And we were very lucky that um, University of Strathclyde, Arizona State University, and Dublin City University um, became engaged in this process and kind of for, and form the base of the Age-Friendly University Global Network. As we look at our timeline, we can see that, you know, in 2014, really when the AF, AFU Global Network was started, there were three members. If we push that out to 2023 now, we're now at 115 members representing um, institutions across the globe and growing. We've had continued growth. We've hosted inaugural age-friendly university conference, engaging aging, which we look forward to bringing back. In 2019, we entered this period of sustainability planning, which resulted in the transition of Arizona State, the transition from DCU to Arizona State of the Secretariat, the development of the Secretariat model, and University of Strathclyde becoming vice chair of the age-friendly university global network. So we thank our partners at Dublin City for hosting the network from 2012 to 2023. And we're really excited about what where we're heading now. I wanna provide just a little bit of background about our governance structure and how you can be involved. And as the founding partners have worked together, we really aim to develop a governance structure that supports our members where they are, meaning the secretariat, which is based at ASU, it builds off the global work of DCU but at the same time, we realized that we really needed regional engagement uh, uh, across the globe to ensure that people were having opportunities to network within their own region, to identify opportunities for cross collaboration, and to identify ways that we can do more targeted outreach and engagement. The efforts of the Secretariat, of course, are supported by the Executive Committee, which includes um, Dublin City University, the University of Strathclyde as the Vice Chair, and of course, Arizona State. And in each of these instances with the regional leads, we also wanna ensure local and regional engagement. And we've, de we've worked to develop models, including regional forums that will bring together like-minded members, partners, and others who can work to advance the age-friendly university global network. We're very excited to have our first three regional leads. These include um, University of Strathclyde, which will be working in the UK and Europe. Arizona State University for the time being will be the North American lead as we continue our transition. The University of Queensland, Australia is our oceanic lead and will be responsible for, the, um, for that area. And in the few, next few weeks, several weeks and months, we hope to be able to announce the other regional leads for South America and Asia. We're also excited what this means for advancing these efforts in the recruitment of non-members. As we've done this, as we've expanded governance and kind of worked with the transition, we've also thought about ways that we can improve our processes. This includes adopting the governance structure, but also developing style guides, um, revisiting our membership to find ways to engage them and ensuring that the universities who are members recommitted to their engagement. We've also started conversations more broadly with the WHO and the Age Friendly Cities Initiative, because one of the things we found in many of our regions is that it's actually cities, cities are asking universities to help them along the way, and universities are asking cities to join. And so there's some great cross collaboration, as well as developing new infrastructure. And we'll talk a little bit about that real quick. I do want, as we think about endorsing the principles and applying 
to be a member of the H Finley University Global Network. I always say it's as easy as one, two, three, um, because really what we're aiming to do is as a potential member, you would develop an H Finley University working group and you would kind of identify who are your champions, who are working at this right now. We recommend doing a review process where you're able to identify what's existing, what needs to be done, and where there might be alignment. And then we hope that you, then uh, uh, additionally, you should gain institutional support and endorsement. We do require a letter from the president, provost, or chancellor as appropriate to indicate that this is something that it's not just a few faculty taking on, but it's something that has institutional support um, and that has institutional backing. And we really find that to be important to bring together the variety of stakeholders that are needed. And then of course, we ask that you complete the H Friendly University application. I will say that this isn't something that we expect you to have already fully formed activities across all 10 principles or to even have implemented activities across 10 principles. We recognize in our membership that people, that different universities and institutions focus on different aspects of the principles just by the nature of their structure and their focus. M many of our members who apply may have something in the works or they may have things that are being planned. What we really look for when the application comes through and the committee reviews them is that there's initiatives that you're planning, that you have ideas from, and that you're moving in the right direction. We operate on a five-year review cycle. And so at the end of year four of your of cycle, we'll send kind of an email reminding you to prepare a brief report about what you've done over the past five years. And where where have your where have your focus has been? Have you focused on you know, similar activities as when you applied, or are you going in new directions? I say that because sometimes we talk to people and they feel like, oh, we can't go for this yet because we don't have existing programs. We don't have activities that are doing all these great things. But we also view our role as being there to support individuals and support universities in developing these activities. We also support our universities um, and institutional members through other things that we do here at here at the Secretariat and through the regional leads. This includes a global website that serves as a web page to kind of promote the Age Friendly University Network, as well as a place that we can promote all of the great work that our members are doing. It's really a one-stop shop for information, um, to access information about the Age Friendly University Global Network. And we really hope in the near future to include additional tools, resources, and educational content and learning opportunities. Um, and you can also access information about applying from this website. As institutions become members, we've really worked hard to develop member resources to support your work. This includes things such as a listserv of members that you can have conversations with, word mark and style guides so you can appropriately brand and market your institution as an age-friendly university, a monthly newsletter that kind of shares upcoming events, best practices, stories from the field, um, regional leads who can help coordinate webinars and other activities within the region, and other activities as we need it. You know, So one thing we have found ourselves doing a lot of is providing quotes for press releases and providing feedback on material as institutions go up. And so we're really here to help you with that, to connect you with other institutions who, who might be in your region and beyond um, and might want to partner. We also try to continue this engagement, like I said, through the Monday Minute, regional events and activities, such as the regional forums. We've looked into the development of policy statements and best practices from what we've learned from our member institutions and what we kind of saw as the commonalities that have led to success. And then also we are populating university profiles so that we can know more about the network and to better respond to member needs. We're really excited as we continue to grow with the launch of the regional leads, uh, the continued growth of institutional resources and targeted outreach in Asia, Africa, and South America, as well as learning more about our members and kind of our ongoing function within the broader age-friendly ecosystem. It's been great to talk to colleagues in public health, cities, and health systems about their interest and kind of how it's, you know, it's very unique, I think, that we have age-friendly universities who then want to be, have their medical centers become age-friendly medical centers. Our medical centers that then are like, why isn't our university age-friendly? And so we saw some excellent cross-collaboration, uh, you know, among these different activities. 
But what I would say is that what you know we exist to support universities to promote positive and active aging, and the way this is done varies from university to university, and. That's one of the things I think that makes this most exciting for me and others is to see all the novel and truly innovative ways that people are engaging their older adult populations in arts and culture, lifelong learning, and really kind of advancing the age-friendly principles and 10 principles of an age-friendly university. And we're excited for where we've been, but we're excited to where we're going as well. And there's multiple opportunities to grow for growth. I would really recommend if you have it to check out the website at afugn.org. And if you have additional questions, please reach out to me at info at afugn.org. Um, and if I can't answer it, I know one of my colleagues or other regional leads or executive committee members can. Um, and with that, I'm really excited to, I think, turn it back over to the moderator so that we can learn more a little bit about what some of our colleagues um, and other leaders in Age-Friendly University Global Network have been doing and kind of to advance their own initiatives at their home institutions. So thank you all so much. I know that was a very brief overview, but I really wanted to ensure we had time for questions as well as to really share some of the great work going on in the field. Thank you. That was awesome. Thank you so much for providing that overview. If folks have questions or comments, uh, feel free to put them in the chat or the Q&A function uh, in the webinar. Uh, and I'm happy to ask those questions. Um, I see one that just popped in. So maybe we'll give you a second to get up, uh, get set up then, Alex. Um, the question is, do you have a program that we can replicate in our university in Guadalajara in Mexico? We are uh, focused in on promoting healthy lifestyles and preventing sarcopenia. Yeah, so one of the things I would say when it comes to replications, we have a lot of partners and universities working at across a variety of domains. So it may be kind of like a, a, a circuitous way to answer it, but just to say that if if we have members who have shared interests, then we do try to connect with one another. So I, I know, for example, that my university, ASU and LaSalle University, both have university-based retirement communities. And one of the things we've really done is we've reached out to each other to kind of identify the best practices for each of those and how we can engage one another, but also kind of engage the broader uh, university-based retirement community overall. Um, I, I, I know Alex is going to talk about their excellent lifelong learning um, efforts that many people have, you know, met with and talked about. Um, the other thing I would just say, the, the, the one that comes to mind immediately is the University of Queensland in Australia. One of the things they did is they actually looked at what other partners were doing and said, oh, like a lot of you have like emeritus colleges where faculty who are retired can get together and engage with one another. And so they're actually developing one of those right now based on kind of the engagement with other age-friendly university members. Very cool. Yeah, I have some uh, examples and data that I'd love to share if we have time as well. But we'll start with uh, Alex McDonald, who's going to show us some uh, interesting sort of programs and ideas that maybe can get everyone thinking about, um, as Aaron mentioned, just the variety of opportunities that exist for participating in this type of a network and, and having your institution designated as age friendly. So over to you, Alex. Hi, Shilpa. Mm -hmm. There we go. I think we're good. You're so good. hello everybody. Can you can we see that? Can you see that okay, Shelpa? Yeah, perfect. Okay, so hi everybody. Um thank you so much for the opportunity to talk with you tonight along with Aaron about the Age Friendly University Global Network. Um, my name is Alex McDonald. I am the head of the Centre for Lifelong Learning and Associate Dean for Flexible um, and Lifelong Learning at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow and my centre sits within our Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences. So I'm really excited to talk to you about the work of Strathclyde and I do this in the spirit of collaboration um, and the hope that perhaps some of you on the call might find something of interest, something to um, replicate, something that you might you might want to um, share or talk with others about. So I'm really aware that research and inclusion um, are likely to be at the heart of a lot of the work of those on the call. Um, so I hope by the end of this, um, you'll be able to see how my institution anyway, um, has combined the principles that Aaron outlined um, to create a place which has something for all, regardless of age or stage in life, as we say. 
So moving on from my first slide. Um, no. So in order to understand why Strathclyde is in this um, uh, in this space, um, you need to understand a little bit about our foundation. So um, Strathclyde University was founded in 1796 by um, John Anderson. Um, now, John Anderson was a natural philosopher and by all accounts, a bit of a character. Um, he was quite controversial and he was a professor at um, another university in the city, in the, at the University of Glasgow, um, but left there and set up an institution with the purpose of providing education for the good of mankind, um, a place of useful learning, as he put it. Now, that ethos has really driven the university since then, and it's been very helpful to um, me in my centre um, in terms of being able to push that, that age-friendly um, agenda and what that means for the university and the having that foundation has been has been really useful. So a little bit about Strathclyde itself um, before I get into the detail. Um, you may not know much about Strathclyde as a university, you may know lots, but as a whistle-stop tour, we're right in the heart of Glasgow. Um, we're only one hour from Edinburgh and we're in Scotland's largest city. We have four faculties, the Faculty of Science, Faculty of Engineering, Faculty of Humanities and Social Science and the Strathclyde Business School. We've got 23,000 students from over 100 countries, and that is further um, enhanced by a, a large population of online and part-time learners, which can sometimes be quite difficult to track, um, but, we, but we have many of them. Um, we've been in this game since 2012 um, with the Age Friendly University um, movement, if you like, um, and we're a founding partner, as Aaron said, alongside Dublin City and Arizona State. The university prides itself on its engagement with industry, um, with 90% of um, its research um, recognised as excellent or world leading in the 2021 REF. So that is a research um, exercise that you know, our universities in the UK go through to um, kind of rank their research um, global um, in terms of its, its worth and value. And we operate a triple helix, so we're very much connecting academia with industry, with government, and we pride ourselves on creating impact through research. Now, I know that I'm sure a lot of that are things that um, the others on the call also um, are aiming for with their work. So to talk a little bit about what makes us age friendly, um, this um, this infographic um, hopefully will will help do that. So basically, what we do is we we what we what we wanted to do is to try to underpin as many of the principles of the AFU as possible, um, in order to demonstrate why why we have that have that badge. Um, some of the programs that we do um, are aimed at older adults, and some are. Um, aimed at younger people as well. So you can see like through our Young Strath Clyder initiative, we take the, the view that age friendly is for, bo for both ends of the spectrum, if you like. Um, so my particular interest is in older learners um, and their needs, but the university also within their age friendly philosophy um, looks at younger children. So whether you're six or seven years old and you want um you can through our Young Strathclyder programme engage with the university um, or through my centre when you're 90, you can come along and take courses, be it on campus, online, or as we hope to do increasingly locally. Um, we have a access programme um, to facilitate student um, adult learners or returners who don't have the um, necessary qualifications to access degree study to do an access to do an access course. Um, we have um, intergenerational programs. Again, that's one of the the principles which um, connect connect generations in a number of ways through a range of projects. We also increasingly are offering upskilling and professional CPD options, um, particularly aimed at those in mid to late career. We find we 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 find that this is an underrepresented area, um, in terms of training and development, and um, the health and wet and health and well being as well of that kind of demographic. Um, it's a it's a very um can be a very challenging and difficult time in life for people um, and we aim to help them navigate that with a range of courses and short short courses um, either to assist with employability or to assist with um, mental health and well-being. Um, 
what we're what, what I am most involved with is the learn at CLL aspect of things. So this is a lifelong learning initiative. Um, we run the only um program in the UK of um short courses aimed specifically at the over fifties, not exclusively, but but it, that is a target market, and that provides both a learning and a social setting for um older learners to come onto campus or learn online, and that's something that the pandemic has really um. It's been one of the few benefits of the pandemic is that we have really embraced online learning. Older learners have embraced online learning, which I think in itself is interesting and dispels a lot of the myths that are that are out there. Um, so we've seen um, we've seen our geographic reach improve um, and we've seen our the ability to offer um, access to students who are learners who would otherwise be unable to to attend so that's been a positive a positive output and something that we're we're continually um developing our learning our our learn 50 plus program as we call it um is really unique and it's supported by a students association for older learners where people can join clubs and societies um and we find that there's a lot of interest in that um in that program and that approach from other um universities we've we've often we often get inquiries um from universities around the world about well how do you do this how do you make that happen how does it work um and so you know i'm happy to to answer any questions you you might have on that um we also as a university because i was very keen when i kind of became the age friendly um champion for for the institution that we walk the walk as an as a university in terms of our policies for our staff um, so we have a number of socially progressive policies um, for our own community of of um, of staff, such as um, additional annual leave purchase schemes. We have carers, um, a carers policy to help people who are caring for whichever generation that might be, um, and the challenges with that. So you know we're and we're always working on on developing more of those. Um, so what we did was. Um, and this is the thing that makes I think what we're doing a little bit um different is um in 2017, um, when I became the head of centre, I decided to establish the our age friendly academy, which is a Strathclyde initiative. Um, and the purpose of that was to bring everything under one roof. And I think that that is sometimes the challenge in universities. We're big organizations, um, we often um, aren't maybe as and I, I speak for my own here maybe as joined up as we could be um, and the purpose of the Age Friendly Academy was really to provide a shop window um, for our work in the institution that covers research um, we have a Strathclyde Aging Network which um, leads on research across the four faculties into a lot many aspects of aging and um, be they scientific be they psychological and um, whatever that looks like but to bring that work to get um together in one place um and also the learning and the opportunities for involvement and volunteering and courses and all of the stuff that we do that 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 um, that appeals to to that audience um and that's been really successful so established in 2017 um it really provides a real underpinning to to what to what we do as an institution in this space um and that has been and that is something that i would encourage i guess anybody who's thinking about um becoming an afu to think about is the external face of the afu so people are are able to see um what that looks like aaron's um the ASU, Arizona State University. Aaron's got a lovely publication um, that really crystallizes what what the age friendly um age friendly looks like in ASU. Um, and I think that's a that's really helpful um is to is to have that kind of evidence, if you like, of what that means. Because I I, I felt like for us back in maybe 2015. 16 if someone had said to me um like if my principal had said to me well what what actually does the AFU look like it was quite bitty so you know pulling it all together in one in one place was the purpose purpose of this um and then I guess just about continuing our journey um there there's a bridge in Scotland called the Fourth Road Bridge which is a, is it's a local joke that you're never done painting it because as soon as you finish painting it you have to start again and I feel like our journey is very much like that at the moment and um, 
we we want to grow and we're always looking for ways to engage um, new audiences and communities. Um, one of the things that I think is great about being a university is the academic academic weight that sits behind that. But also, it can be quite off putting for people, um, in not understanding that 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 there's that there's something for them in a university. So I'm keen that we look at how we take the university out the university, um, going forward. Um, we're looking we're we're starting to um create sort of satellite um spots around around Glasgow, and that's quite exciting just to be able to reach new people. Um, there's still a lot of work to be done around the internal profile, and that's the battle. It's about getting senior officers on side and um, convincing them that this is a valuable um, opportunity um, and that it can bring a, hu- a, a real distinctiveness to um, to your, your institution. So I think that that is that that's something that we really we, we, we will continue to work on. And at, at the moment, I. Um, I'm drafting a, a lifelong learning strategy for the whole institution to really drive that um, age-friendly message home um, and to re- further raise the profile of it within within Strathclyde. And lastly, but by no means least, the new governance structure that we have in the in the network is really exciting for me because it puts Strathclyde at the head of the um, Europe. Um, charge to um, recruit new members. So. Um, Anybody that's on the call from that region, they can either come to me via Aaron or come directly to me. I'm really interested, happy to talk to any any institutions that are on the call that are interested in in you know finding out more, considering joining. We are happy to to talk to you about that. So that is that's really a kind of whistle stop tour of where we are at Strathclyde. As I say, all age friendly universities do things differently. This network very much exists to help support and disseminate all our work. Um, and hopefully seeds of ideas can maybe be taken from presentations like this um, as to how your own institutions could follow suit. Or maybe you've got other expertise to share, better ideas, exciting ideas. Um, I think the AFU Global Network really can provide a fertile ground for collaboration and sharing of good practice. Um, there's an opportunity here to create something very special and um, which can make a difference to people and society as well as providing your institution with a uniqueness of approach so thank thank you so much for your time it's been a pleasure talking to you and as i said as as with Aaron, happy to answer any questions you might have awesome thank you so much for that uh, rundown of the programs there is a question in the chat for you alex um it's from simone uh, so very interesting initiative. Congratulations. I'm from the University of Rome uh, in Italy. In January 2024, they are starting the European Partnership for Judo Connecting Older and Younger Generations, uh, Erasmus Plus Sport Project in nine European countries. Uh, your, uh, your principle number four uh, regarding promotion of intergenerational learning um, is also part of our aims. It would be great to learn from your experience and expertise and wondering about some kind of collaboration. Yeah, thanks, someone for the for the question and comment. Yeah, I, I absolutely. Um, we've been involved in Erasmus projects um in the past, and um we would be happy to to discuss how we could collaborate on that. And I and there are colleagues in in the university that are very experienced in running intergenerational pro intergenerational projects. So if you want to, um, Aaron, am I right in saying that my contact details are on the are on the website? Yes, they are. Thank you. Um. Yeah, so if you want to drop me an email, um, Simone, please feel free to do so and we can pick up that conversation conversation from there. Um, feel free to continue putting questions in the chat. I We have a few minutes, so I'm just going to walk you through the case study at our institution, just so you can see some of the differences. Uh, we don't quite have the same setup at uh, our institution, um, but we have been trying to sort of get the community more involved with our university. Uh, we're in a, a town or a city, I should say, of about 175,000 people in the greater Toronto area, uh, so millions of people sort of surrounding us, um, but we are sort of on the outskirts of the sort of metropolitan city, and so engaging with the community is important to our university because we are part of this sort of small city. Um, so I just thought I'd show you some of the things that we've done over the last couple of years. We got designated as an age-friendly university 
five minutes before the pandemic started. So uh, it really created some challenges for us uh, in terms of engagement in the first couple of years. But we have sort of um, uh, been able to make some movement. Um, one of the things that we've chatted with other groups about is the the difference in our um, setup is that we're actually through the provost's office, so the vice president academic, which has helped us get some of that internal recognition at the university that uh, Alex mentioned is a challenge. So our senior leadership is well aware that we're an age-friendly university and they love talking about it. Uh, and it gives me an opportunity to get on their agenda and present to them with some of the initiatives that we have um, been undertaking. So that just gives you a bit of a sense of what our committee's mandate is. And we've done all sorts of programs where basically we're trying to open the doors to our university, to older adults in the community. And, you know, we do various programs where we have older adults come in, they listen to keynote speakers, learn about facilities and um, programs on campus that they can participate in as community members. The big uh, thing for us is, of course, we don't want to be this gated off community in our city. We want to open the doors and let people know that they can come to our campus. We have a website uh, that um, older adults in our community can log on to and see what we're up to. And we also have a newsletter that we uh, try and send out every month. Our uh, membership has grown. This might not sound like a big number to some, but for us, it's very exciting that we have over 350 older adults in our community that get our monthly newsletter. I don't really know what the engagement is on it, but hey, it's something. Um, we recently got some funding um, from the Ministry of uh, Seniors and Accessibility in uh, the province of Ontario. And we ran uh, a survey and focus groups to try and get a sense of where folks uh, were interested in getting engaged. Um, and as you can see, with the magic of, of uh, social media ads, we had about 450 uh, older adults in our local community respond to a survey within a matter of uh, weeks. Um, this was the age distribution of the people that were interested in our programs. Um, and as you can see, we were sort of focused on asking questions like, have you been to our campus? Are you interested in being here? Uh, would you like to visit? A lot of maybes, so clearly a lot of hesitance in uh, members of the community uh, with coming to our campus. So something for us to work on. Uh, we asked them about sort of the facilities they would be interested in coming to campus so that we could give that feedback to those different facilities across campus. Uh, and then we also asked them uh, what types of opportunities they'd like to engage with, uh, with, with our students. So would they like to mentor them, uh, provide uh, any type of guest lectures? And you can see that there is quite a bit of of interest in participating in research, which is very exciting for those of us who have research programs focused on engaging older adults. Uh, we also asked what they'd like to see our students participating in in the community, and they provided some insight there. Um, and then based on the survey responses, we held a couple of really quick focus groups online and got tons of additional feedback and, and interest and excitement from older adults in the community uh, telling us what they would like to do. So, you know, they, some of them were very excited about the idea of um, teaching students how to cook. Some of them wanted to audit courses or go back to grad school. Some of them wanted to, uh, you know, play board games with our students. Uh, meet international students, mentor students, uh, learn different languages, learn about um, the children with disabilities. Uh, they wanted to tell their stories. They wanted to participate in sports. So we got all sorts of really interesting insight from that those focus groups. Um, the board game theme came out loud and strong <laughs> across some of those focus groups. So we set up some programming for students and seniors on campus at our campus pub to play board games. Uh, this front picture on this side with the three young men and the three older women, they were playing cards against humanity. I'm not sure if you've ever played this game, but it's wildly inappropriate. They had a blast. Uh, so three 70 year old women and three 20 something year old men had a great, uh, great time. Um, we had this uh, sort of advertisement that went out to the community again through social media ads. We had about um, 35 to 40 people show up that first games night students emailing me saying how it was one of the best sort of uh, things that they had participated in as an undergraduate student, older adults emailing me saying it was just one of their favorite events uh, in the local community because of that intergenerational component. Um, I also ran in one of my courses an adopt a grand student program where older adults were paired with uh, kinesiology students and had to show them sort of the physical activities that they're engaging in. I mean, this was, talk about getting rid of ageism. This was one of the most effective interventions I've ever seen. I couldn't believe the excitement on both ends. We had 90 seniors sign up within a couple of weeks. I had to turn some of them down because I didn't have enough students to pair them with. 
Uh, the students had so much social anxiety going into this. I would say over 50% of them in their final report commented on how much it helped with their social anxiety to meet with these seniors. Um, some students took the seniors to learn hip hop dancing. And uh, one of them sent me a video of them salsa dancing in someone's living room together. Uh, there were all sorts of great things that came out of this, including the fact that, um, as you can see from that last quote on the slide, some of the older adults really changed their perceptions of of uh, the student body. Right? They they really thought, oh my goodness, like what are we what are we saying about this generation? There's so much hope for the future with these kids. Uh, we also have facilities on campus that older adults are really keen on using. I'm not sure uh, how popular pickleball is where you are, but it is all the rage out this way and people are constantly looking for places to play pickleball. So we uh, offered up some of our facilities for seniors to play in the summer, um, a free program as a first time trial. It filled up within three days and I have not stopped receiving um, inquiries since. There's a huge demand. What was really nice as you can see from this picture is we had seniors come in and teach some of our students how to play pickleball as well and, and they really enjoyed that um, interaction. So for us, what's next? Uh, we really want to continue to grow our communication with the community of older adults uh, that are uh, living locally because that's kind of our uh, our biggest sort of uh, key to determining the success of what we're doing. Um, there has been some pretty good uptake with research opportunities through our newsletter. As I mentioned, we're at about 350 uh, and hoping to grow that newsletter outreach. Um, it's become really clear to us in the last couple of years that the focus needs to be on intergenerational programming. There's huge benefits for the students and for the seniors in the community. Uh, lots of uh, great opportunity there. So I think as a university in our community, that's the unique thing we can offer. Uh, and so that seems to be where we're really going to focus. Um, and then, of course, uh, opening the doors of our university. Uh, every year we have two campus community connect events with keynote speakers and an opportunity to tour our facilities. Um, this last time we had 70 older adults register for the event and about 55 showed up on the day of the event. So we think that that's a great way to get the word out, not only about our programming, but about what the institution is contributing to our local community. So I'll stop uh, there. Just I wanted to give you that little example of what we're doing here at our little uh, university in uh, the, the greater Toronto area. And again, as I mentioned, we're happy to answer any questions that you might have about the process for having your university designated and some of the benefits associated with being part of this age-friendly university network. So feel free to add questions in the Q&A or in the chat, uh, and we're happy to have a little conversation right now, I guess, for a discussion. And as we're waiting, I would just echo and say we welcome your application. You know, we welcome your engagement. If you have questions, our regional leads are here to help. I'm here to help. But we really, we really are interested in growing the network and learning more about all the great work that you're doing. Yeah, I mean, while we're waiting for questions, I will say uh, I started the process at our institution just on my own. I'd heard about it and I thought we should do this. And it was just nothing but positive response with everyone I took it to. So I, I took it to um, various managers of different business units around our campus. I had a couple of town halls. I basically just told the president that there was going to be something on his desk that he has to sign. And he was really excited about the, the whole idea. It lines up really well with a lot of the priorities um, for our campuses. And as Aaron mentioned, uh, cities as well are, are uh, all working towards being age friendly. And so this is something that sort of adds to their portfolio to show this connection with local educational institutions as well. So it's been I would say almost entirely positive uh, from my uh, perspective. There's been hiccups with engagement, and I'm sure you can comment more on that as well, Alex, with, with actually getting older adults involved. But I think it takes some time and you have to build some momentum and word of mouth is really important. But um, I, I'm not sure what you do, Alex, but I, I've been invited to go to like local Lions clubs and Probus groups and Rotary meetings and, and talk about the Age Friendly Network. And that's really helped us build sort of our engagement in the community. Yeah, I, I, I'm I'm a big fan of word of mouth. I think that's the most potent um, recruiter and awareness raiser that you can have. You know, like um, and so I spend a lot of my time, and so do a number of my colleagues, just going out and talking to people, as you say, and and raising that awareness and breaking down barriers about perceptions that there's that the university is maybe a you know got high walls and not and not for 
for everybody. So I think that's that's really important. And I, I was really inspired by what you were talking about with the intergenerational work because um I think that that's something that we could do more of the intergenerational work we often do is um with, with schools and older pe older people through our through our school of education. Um and I think we could do more with our own student community on that. So that's really interesting the work that you're that you're doing there. Yeah, it's been it's been great. Uh, I think we, we have a lot of services and, and I'm sure many communities do for older adults, um, you know, community centers and uh, various programs and not for profits. But the one thing that we can offer that other folks in the community can't is this interaction with uh, our students. And and when you think about um, the efforts to reduce ageism, I, I found it, it was just, I wish I had collected more data on some of the programs that we ran because it was just unreal. Uh, ageism in both directions were, uh, were massively reduced, I should say, because uh, both generations learned so much about one another um, that, that it, it just helped, um, you know, that experiential learning opportunity really helped them uh, reduce their stereotypes for that that generation are most of the students in your university Shilpa are most of them local to the area that you're in or uh, do I you think have... it's about 50 percent or so um some of them move locally uh, but they're all expected to be on campus for various um academic requirements so they they have to be available did you find that those engaging with the intergenerational projects were one were students that had perhaps were perhaps newer to the area or so, um the the adopted grand student program I ran through one of my courses that I teach so it was a required component of the course okay okay yeah okay. we have another question here um so uh Lamb, I hope I said that right, from Mozambique. Uh, we are we work with older adults for 15 years in my university, and I would like to join this initiative. How can we do it? Erin, uh, is there a link you can maybe just throw into the chat? And yeah, then I'll just, I'll, I'll put our, I'll first put our sp very specific link, and then I will um, go in and put our, you know, join us kind of link where you can learn more about the application process and kind of the information that we look for. So we definitely wel welcome membership um, and we're happy to talk more with you about that if you have questions. Um, I'm just gonna throw that in. I think you put it in the- uh... Oh yeah, I may have put it to the wrong, sorry. <laughs> Okay, well, we don't have to use up the entire hour. I, mean, I think we can take 10 minutes back in our day if we'd like, but I really appreciate uh, you taking the time, Alex and Aaron, to share uh, information regarding the Global Age-Friendly University Network with the ISPINPA members. I hope you'll hear from a few folks, and I hope folks from ISPINPA, um, you know, reach out to me or to anyone else to learn more about the programs and the benefits that there are as researchers and educators in our communities uh, I think there's tons of, of sort of cross collaboration opportunities as well. So hopefully you've learned uh, what the benefits are of the AFU network. And uh, yeah, we encourage you to join. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.